they, they practiced yesterday. Yeah, it was done yesterday. Just so you guys know, out in the tent, the TV got fried, and there's no TV anymore out there. So for lyrics and stuff, anybody would have to look up, uh, look up here. Water's not good for electronics. No es bueno. We did our best. I guess we could have done better at preventing that. Letting our choir assemble. You guys will please rise with us. We will open the day with shout to the Lord. <laughs> Trying to get everything back to normal, wherever normal is. All right.
So what, what does Keith always say? Wow. Just wow. <laughs> Open in prayer, Rianne Phillips. Thank you. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done this feast for us. We have had an amazing time praising your name. I ask and pray that the message today hits our hearts and our minds and that we can carry it out to the world since your feast days are ending. As sad as we are about it, Lord, we do praise and thank you for everything that you've given us this week. I ask and pray that you show love out into the world as we go. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 All right. All right. Jesus Messiah will be our next selection. Very, very beautiful song. Lord, I'm 
Choices Day because somebody came yesterday and beat you all to all of them. So we're going to do broken things next. Where is? I don't get the same. Come on down. Come on down, Dad. Oh, you can say broken things. Broken things. As we are. was a kingdom. I stopped at the gate, thinking I don't deserve to pass through all the wrong, the mistakes that I've made. Oh, but I heard a whisper as heaven went down. Said, child, don't you know that the first will be last and the last Now I'm just a beggar in the presence of a king. I wish I could bring so much more. But if it's true, you use broken things, then here I Never the perfect, it's always the ones with the scars that you use. Oh, it's the rebels and the prodigals, it's the humble and the weak. All those distant heroes you chose, Teddy Dares, the forces lie. So please be seated. Uh, we're going to have a couple of script. Uh, uh, we have actually three special music today. So first up will be Melba Howard, <laughs> A.K.A. Melba Gordon. <laughs> And after she is done, if Leon Daniels would come on down and give his special music.
Check, check, check. Well, I'm going to sing one a cappella, and it's going to be Holy of Holies. And those of you that know it, I'd love if you'd sing along, because I need, I need help. <laughs> I enter the Holy of Holies. I enter through the blood of the Lamb. I enter to worship you only. I enter to honor I am. Lord, I worship you. I worship you. Lord, I worship you, I worship you, for your name is holy, holy, Lord, for your name is holy, holy, Lord. I enter the holy of holies. I enter through the blood of the Lamb. I enter to worship you only. I enter to honor I am. Lord, I worship you. I worship you. Lord, I worship you. I worship you, for your name is holy, holy, Lord, for your name is holy, holy, Lord. Let the weight of your glory cover us. Let the life of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the weight of your glory, let the weight of your glory fall. Let the weight of your glory let the weight of your glory fall. Once I started the master race, I had so much love in my heart, but I was not down before the race could even start. And the Lord lifted me up again, but I fell once more into my sin. And the Lord lifted me up again, now I'm in the race, and I'm in the race to win. I fell down before the holy throne on my very face, asking God to save me, save me by his grace. I am running the master race. Once I started the master race, I did not think the race could be won. Because I was knocked down before the race could even be done. And the Lord lifted me up again, but I fell once more into my sin. And the Lord lifted me up again, now I'm in the race, and I'm in the race to win. I fell down before the holy throne on my very face, asking God to save me. Save me by his grace. I am running the master race. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I cannot run this race alone.
another while. That was my dad, by the way. <laughs> he, he told someone, I think the first day or two we were here, he said, that's my son. So I kind of ran with something Ben said the other day. Out here, they was, uh, you know, when these kids were taking signatures, a little girl came up. I said, oh, by the way, that's my dad. She looks, <laughs> she looks at Leon. She, she looks at me. I said, oh, yeah, just in case you haven't noticed, I'm black. <laughs> and boy, that confusion still went on. And I, I don't know who that was. We may have to kind of maybe explain that later. I don't know. But uh, so see, uh, you know, being that joke still works. Doesn't matter the circumstance. It, it, it works. So we kind of hang on that. So next we'll have a scripture reading by Austin Ward. I'm going to bring you up here. I'm just going to read Proverbs 16. That was what they wanted me to read. But the beginning, middle, and end is what's been kind of pointing to me all this week so far. So we can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. The Lord's made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked, for a day of disaster. The Lord detests the proud, they'll surely be punished. Unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin. By fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. When people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. We can make our own plans, but the Lord determines our steps. It's the middle, by the way. The king speaks with divine wisdom. He must never judge unfairly. The Lord demands accurate scales and balances. He sets the standards for fairness. A king detests wrongdoing, for his rule is built on justice. The king is pleased with words from righteous lips. He loves those who speak honestly. The anger of the king is a deadly threat. <clears throat> the wise will try to appease it. When the king smiles, there's life. His favor refreshes like a spring rain. How much better to give wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver. The path of the virtuous leads away from evil. Whoever follows that path is safe. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. Those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. The wise are known for their understanding, and pleasant words are persuasive. Discretion is a life-giving fountain to those who possess it, but discipline is wasted on fools. From a wise mind comes wise speech. The words of the wise are persuasive. <clears throat> kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. It is good for workers to have an appetite. An empty stomach, stomach drives them on. Scoundrels create trouble. Their words are a destructive blaze. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Violent people mislead their companions, leading them down a harmful path. With narrowed eyes, people plot evil, and with a smirk, they plan their mischief. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It's gained by living a godly life. Better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. We get the band and the choir back up, and we're actually going to sing a song out of Proverbs. Uh, we're going to do turn, 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 but it's using the words of Proverbs. Or Ecclesiastes. See, I told you I, I wasn't the smartest guy in the crowd. You know, remember, remember when I said, you know, we don't know it all? Hey, I'm a prime example of that in a heartbeat. Same author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point or 
our church band said, hey, Turn, Turn, Turn's a pretty cool song. It's kind of right out of the Bible. Why not do that? Yeah, yeah. My wife just walked up and told me the same thing. It's not the book of Ecclesiastes. So they're trying to really make sure. Yes, it's in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the birds. Birds. Birds, yes. The song's the by the turtles. <laughs> We've just heard it right here. They've been around a long time. They're slow. That's what I said too, but I thought turtles was pretty funny. It's good. It's good. All right, here we go. Yes, you guys can stand. To everything, turn, turn. Now you could be seated. We are doing something special in the next song. The choir can also sit. Uh, this song was requested again. Uh, we did it earlier part of the week. We're going to do I Can Only, everybody sing with it, but we're doing I Can Only Imagine, and Gina is going to sign the song for you. It's very beautiful if you've never seen it, so just kind of get it to give her the limelight here. So I Can Only Imagine in another language or something? Is that how we can, how can we say that? Look, she tried to do Days of Elijah the other night and she was bouncing all over the hall. So <laughs> this is a slower song. <laughs> Take your time. See A, B, C. Yeah, I got. Yeah, I know. I got to do that all the time. My brain. Okay, here we go. I can only. 
only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or will all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes. And I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or will all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah. can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only I don't know what was going on over there, but it was all I could do to keep from crying. What if I was just, going? I was fixing to say, I about lost it too. When she, <laughs> she jumped off, I wasn't expecting that. You know, these acrobatics to come off of here. And yeah, so I had, so at least you didn't quit singing, I quit singing. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. Man, I just tell you, it gets better and better and better. Wow. Uh, got one quick announcement. John Wilson has created these, uh, just a holy day calendar for you guys on the back table. If anyone wants one, he says grab them. He can print more. Uh, just a, a dollar ninety-nine. 
Two ninety nine. So we're gonna split that. Okay. No, they are for free. So uh, just if you want one, take one. So next we'll have our prayer team to come forward, or our prayer team representative. Boy, what an act to follow. That was so beautiful. So beautiful. We as a team want to thank y'all. Y'all have just been so gracious and so wonderful for all of us on the team. And we feel our combined presence of our Holy Spirit, of God's Holy Spirit coming together. And I just want you to know that when we all pray, it just lifts and you can feel the prayers going to God. So I thank you for all of those prayers and for all the love that you have in your heart for this. So thank you. Uh, I want to remind everyone, November the 5th, is the International Day of Prayer. And we have a lot of persecuted brethren all over the world. Um, of course, India, we've, we've seen that. We've, well, Nigeria also has had over 2,000 people that have been killed. So, I mean, we have got persecution that is starting all over the world. You know, Wisconsin, we saw the riots and, and how, you know, they were persecuted just for speaking out. So it's in our country, and it's just going to get much bigger. So please keep that in mind. We had a mother who um, has called in and asked for prayers for her daughter, Rachel. She's not feeling well, and she said it's, she's very ill. Um, we have people that are concerned about uh, the job that they have or the, the lack of job, and they're asking for direction that God show them what job they should be taking and help them along their walk. And um, I know that uh, Megan has been experiencing some swelling, and, you know, we just pray that that is nothing serious and she has no complications with the birth of a new life. And um, we do have one family that remained anonymous that they have a huge dynamic going on within the family and it's causing a great deal of struggles <coughs> and so they're hoping that we'll lift them up as well. So if you will bow your heads please. Our loving Father, our most gracious and merciful creator you wish nothing but good things for your people you have promised us that when we come to you in faith and ask in accordance with your will that there is no prayer you will not answer we just ask that you please be with these people that are struggling please help the, the gentleman to find the right job so that he can continue his walk with you and glorify you. We just ask for any of the health issues that you would please reach out, touch these wonderful people, and help them to be healed mentally, physically, spiritually. We know that a family, when they're going through something, you know, very hard. We have a lot of dynamics within it that, you know, not everyone is always on the same page and it can cause a little conflict, a little strife. You know that situation and you know what needs to be done and we just ask that you please be with them and help them to resolve the issues so that whatever it is, it will come out to glorify you. We thank you always for hearing our prayers and for our calling. We know that it's not always an easy walk, but we know we win in the end, and we just thank you for the knowledge that you've given us. 
And I ask all of this in Yeshua's holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. Next, we'll have our FIF news team to come forward. Today, and then we also had some yesterday. We've got uh, from the Michigan Baker family, Janet Baker, which she, she uh, she's 18 years old, and we got what? Forrest Baker. Forrest? What? That's an F. <laughs> Dude, we tried. I had three different people read it to me, trying to figure out what it said. It was not right. I hope I hope I hope I don't butcher these names. Close. It was close. I had four different, like three or four different people. Anyways, okay, we've got two different people from the Anderson's Fellowship in Hot Springs, Arizona? Arkansas! Arkansas. Look, this that, handwriting is not mine. It's okay, I, I give grace to the news. <laughs> okay, uh, Gabe and Abigail Corpton? Compton. Compton. There's an R. <laughs> Yeah, they're 18 and 15. Yes. Wow. We got that right. I can get that right. I just cannot read the rest of it, apparently. These interns, man. These interns. <laughs> okay, and then, and then yesterday we had, we, there was a baptism for Amber. You got this. Piper? Piper? Piper, okay. Good. Uh, That's Anna's niece. Yeah. That, that's words. <laughs> that's the words. Okay, we also have an announcement for the Spring Feasts in April, the April 22nd through the 29th of 2024. Petit? Jean. What? Uh, that word, Jean Mountain, Arkansas. See Brian or... Um, Gina Anderson. I do they work. Good job. <laughs> we have another announcement too. We are taking silence in turn. Announcements are happening. Bad intern. Bad bad intern. I will take away microphone privileges again. As I was trying to say. We are taking up a tip for Debbie, the housekeeper. If anyone would like to give, please see John Wilson over there in the yellow. Woo! Love Miss Debbie. And today is Friday on the feast, and we're going to be having a sermon by Mr. Michael. Ooh, I'm looking forward. Blow my mind, please. Or don't pay much. <laughs> <laughs> They're close. Set it up. <laughs> That's my bad. I said that one. It was way too easy for him. You I made it too easy. That. You should know better. I should. I should know better. You're you. And about at 1.30 p.m., we're going to have a smorgasbord potluck and a scavenger hunt awards then. And 
scavenger hunt awards will be awarded in the morning. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, it has been changed. It will now be Saturday when they're doing the awards for the scavenger hunt. And if you have not already, place your uh, book in the little pretty box back there on the table. The book for the scavenger hunt with all the little names, all the little stampy stamps, that stuff. Then we should be having Ushering in Eternity prayer service at 6 p.m. today. And then, you know, ish. You know how it is at this point. It's ish. Well, sunsets, a little less ish. Oh, yeah, that's true. A little less ish because of that, but still a little ish. And then at 7.30 to 9 p.m., it's going to have an interactive Bible study. Do we know who's doing that? True, but... I Miss Sarah and Miss Amanda are going to be hosting the interactive Bible study. And then after that, it'll be Saturday, and we're going to have a sermon by Mr. Uncle Roger, wherever he is. Oh, there he is. You're so tall. I should be able to see you better. After services, I, I did say, I mentioned it. Yeah, we're gonna. Food. Miss Devon, why are you letting the intern talk? We talked about this. Okay, it's working now. I'm sorry, Jasmine. It has been a very stressful day. The intern has been driving me up the wall. Um, I had to take away microphone privileges multiple times already. Please forgive me. I'll forgive you, not the intern. Not to mention, I don't need for some reason, shush. <laughs> my allergies have been bothering me like crazy because of the rain. For some reason, they aren't affecting me right now. I don't know why. Um, speaking about that, we are in the millennium? Is that what this place is called? Millennium, I believe so is. Well. All right, all right. We have a few lovely participants for our interviews today. What's it like here? Would you please tell me? Well, when the kids go out to play and they fall, there's no boo-boos for their mommies to kiss. Oh, that is wonderful. I have sisters. It's terrible. How about you? Well, North Korea and South Korea don't fight each other anymore, and Germany is free once more. Nice to know, nice to know. Intern, do you want to take this one, or are you going to be trouble again? I'll take trouble, go to the next. All right, what about you? What's it like here for you? Well, the nimble house cat actually cares about you now. <laughs> Wonderful! Are you able to tell that they care about you? How do you tell? I have cats at home. It's hit or miss, 90% of the time. Well, they don't try to claw you anymore. Oh my goodness, that would save my clothes so much. I have to sew so many holes because of those cats. What about you? What's it like here for you? There is no colds and there's no diseases. No diseases, you say? What about allergies like gluten and uh, milk allergies. What about those? No, nope, none of them. They don't exist at all? Really? Did you hear that, Jasmine? I heard that. No war, no allergies, cats love you. That's crazy. <laughs> Honestly, that's crazy. What? Oh, one more question. What about interns? Do they cooperate? No. No more. No. no more cooperation or no more interns? <laughs> interns. What? I'm sorry, Jasmine, but this is my last day at this news. This news. <laughs> whatever this place is called, this is my re registration. Take my intern. He's your problem now. I Thank you and goodbye. I really don't want him. I need new interns. I'm gonna turn gray again. What did I do? 
Also, by the way, this is the second to last day of the feast. I don't know why she didn't mention that. The intern thinks it can talk. How bold. How I'm bold not a slave. I will not be shushed. This has... Miss um, Devin, where are you going? She quit. She quit. I quit! You're forgetting. We I have quit to as well. You're forgetting. No, you're She forgot one small detail. We're gonna announce the credits. <laughs> Miss Devon, you're part of the credits. I did not forget. The intern's, the intern's chasing you. Hide. Save me, Jasmine. Save me from the intern. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I had to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Would everybody in the cast today please take their bows? <laughs> Even the happy dog. <laughs> He's the intern. Uh, I'm the janitor. Uh, I got roped into this. I'm not happy. He gets paid more than me, so can I have the raise? I'll no. <laughs> well, then I'm not happy. I can have this back. I got roped into this anyway. <laughs> On a more serious note, I would like for Sarah Brower um, and Jasmine's mom to please stand up if they're here. Miss Rita Brower. Miss Rita Brower, could they please stand up wherever they are? Sarah and Rita Brower. I don't know where Everett Mounts the Second is right now. If you were here, I would have him stand up. Um, anyways. Don't even think about it. You're not my intern, but don't think about it. Anyways, <laughs> please, everyone, clap for these two wonderful ladies. They have been a big help to us all. And, and, we're getting, we're getting the person back there. That one, over there. Ah, yes. Thank you, Uncle Mike, for forcing us to do this. It has been fun. I hope you, everyone in the crowd had fun as well. And I would like for everyone to give a standing ovation to Genesis and Nineveh. We only met them this feast, and they have taken everything in stride. What about Solomon? He's included. He's included. We also have uh, humble mentions for Mr. Gabe, Mr. Solomon, and Mr. Enoch over here. I suppose we can include Mr. Aaron in this too. And if Rianne could please stand up, please. She kept her father off of our backs so we could actually work. This last skit was his idea, but we practically threw all scripts out the window with this one. I didn't recognize it. But you did better than what I wrote. We had the idea, and that was it. That's all we took from you. Michael, if you have us do this every day for announcements next year, our hair will turn gray. Yes. <laughs> Remember what happened to Jasmine. It will be worse. And this has been... <laughs> this is not meant for the audience. <laughs> This has been Jasmine Brower, Devin Mounts, and Tommy Caldwell. And this is the last time we will get to do announcements for you all. This year. <laughs> to be continued. Yay! Somebody left their cup. 
say Jasmine, I think. It's all fading in the screen. Mm -hmm. I'm glad they finally explained what Aaron was up here for. I was, I was like, you know, I am happy, and uh, I already tried to get more money out of him. I can, I can tell you a little story about him. He is kind of the kid back at home that if you give him an allowance, you know, he thought you got the, 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 the wage increase like everybody else with Social Security. All right. So uh, we're going to have uh, John Wilson to come down. He has a few things to, to announce to say. And then he'll uh, announce uh, Mr. Michael Deary. Roger, I might announce Mr. Michael Deary. Might. <laughs> might. This is awkward for me, and uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I'm not an impromptu speaker. Uh, but this wasn't my choice. I was told early this morning that maybe I needed to say this. First of all, hasn't it been a great feast? Yes, yes it has. It really has. It's been different, and it's uh, been exciting. It's been enjoyable. It's been inspiring. We've learned a lot. This morning, I woke up pretty early, started thinking about different things, and I started, started thinking about everybody here. A lot, of them, a lot of you have already met, and uh, a lot of you have already touched. I've shaken your hand, I've touched your arm, we've hugged, and everything like this. And I got to thinking about all of that, and this is what I want to share with the thoughts that came to my mind. Uh, so I would say that they were inspired, but either way, the, I was trying to figure out what, what the feeling was I was uh, going through since we've been here at the feast. And it's been increasing and increasing and it's been joy, it's been peace, it's been exciting, it's been stirring, and I don't know any other words to describe this. And I'm trying to think in terms of where has this come from? And what came to my mind was that it was from each and every one of you that I came in contact with. We know that we are filled with God's Spirit, but have we given any consideration to the fact that when we get together, we share that Spirit? God puts the Spirit in us that we need individually. And I'm not sure, I could be speaking out of turn, but this could be a situation where God puts a little bit of different Spirit in you, than you, and then you, than me. And so he provides the spirit that we need for growth. And we find a lot of times that some of our misunderstanding, controversies, and everything come from uh, the fact that there's a little bit of a difference in the spirit that you need and that I need. And there's, we see that difference, and we're not quite understanding it. I will say, think about this when you are with each other, uh, when you hug each other, when you shake hands, when you touch each other, and everything. And I'm a touchy person. I, I think you've all found that out, uh, most of you. Uh, but think in terms of the fact that when you do that, there is some of God's Spirit that's crossing. And that's what I'm feeling. And it is joy. I mean, it is just very uplifting. And it's, uh, it's really done wonders for me during this feast. And I thank each and every one of you for that. But do keep in mind that God's spirit is transferable between us, and we gain our total strength from being with each other. Thank you. Now, Michael, if you uh, would like to come up. John, you made a really good point. You know, you remember that uh, the prophet Elisha had asked Yahweh Elohim for seven times more of the spirit than Elijah had. So that's a very good point that you brought up. Let me see. Hold on a moment. Let me get my PowerPoint up here. He was read in Proverbs here by uh, Brother Austin, you know, that man plans 
his way. And Yahweh Elohim directs his steps. And so um, my intro is going to be just a little bit different than uh, I kind of anticipated, simply because of the fact that, uh, I don't know say, it kind of really hit me this morning because for the first time in many years, all three of my daughters are here at the feast with their husbands and my grandchildren. And they're all here together and we're all here together. And this is Kurt and Joey's first feast with us. And so I wanna say, Kurt, welcome. Joey, welcome. And this is our, our church family. So when you see them afterwards, please make sure we, you know, you're part of our family. Make sure you smother them with all the love that we've enjoyed this feast and welcome them, welcome them uh, into our family as well. So I give praise to Yahweh Elohim for, the, for that blessing and I want to acknowledge it and thank you for allowing me to do that. Uh, it was really interesting about um, <clears throat> doing the, uh, the message today. Give a little history here. Those of uh, you that have been at that, that, uh, the Kentucky Dam Village, that have been uh, with us for a while. You notice I've given the, the message on the uh, eighth day, the last great day, for the last five years. And the, the reason that it happened is once we got started out there for the first time in 2017, I think the first couple of years, Skip Martin turned to me and he shook his head and he says, you know, it was a great feast, but you know what's missing? He says, every time we have a last great day message, it's not about the last great day, it's about something else. You know, either it's a general sermon or it's about something that happens at the beginning of the millennium. He goes, Skip goes, I'd like to hear a message about the last great day, the eighth day, on the eighth day. And he says, and I've been talking to the, you know, the minister cast. He goes, and they just, they just won't do it. I don't know what it is. And I said, well, I'll be your, I'll be your huckleberry. I'll be your guinea pig. I guess I can do that. And for whatever reason, because I had to do a dig in the study, um, I've modified that same message about five different ways. And so uh, this year I decided, well, I kind of would like to do something just a little bit different. So uh, I, I put it on Roger's head, gave him the last great day message. So he's going to uh, uh, give, us, give us that tomorrow. And hopefully what I do here today is set things up so that Roger can tap it in. Because as was mentioned, you know, today, brethren, is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The last day. Tomorrow is something different. Tomorrow's the eighth day. It's a whole, it's a whole other assembly. That's the seventh feast. And so um, Roger's gonna talk about that. I didn't want to step on his toes. And all of us here at this feast, you know, what we did is we followed the biblical command to observe and keep this feast to the Lord. And as it is written, and we'll cover some scriptures here, because what's a sermon without some scriptures, right? It is Leviticus 23, 39, 41, reviews kind of good. It says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the produce of the land, you are to celebrate a feast to the Lord for seven days. There shall be a complete rest on the first day and also on the eighth day. On the first day, you are to gather the fruit of majestic trees, the branches of palm trees, and the boughs of leafy trees and the willows of the brook. And you are to rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You are to celebrate this as a feast to the Lord for seven days each year. This is a permanent statute for the generations to come. You are to celebrate it in the seventh month. I think we got that down, Pat. Do we not rejoice this week? Amen. We have rejoiced this week. And I hope our Abba Yan, I'm sure he's very pleased. As I said, I don't know how you topped last year, but we have done it. You know, we had a baptism out back and, and the service today, just uh, Kristen's testimony is, wow, how much, keep saying wow. Keep, Keith, we're just going to go, wow, 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 wow. We have to make a song about wow. And it's just amazing. And, you know, uh, the girls built uh, Mel and um, uh, Sarah, and the girls have a suga. We have two of them. We have one out in back of Sarah's and one right out back over here, and they decorate it, and they put the boughs of leafy trees. 
And they, people sat under it. Keith, I know, sat under the one uh, back behind uh, Sarah's place. It was a time to reflect, a time to be under that temporary tabernacle, so it, so, so it is. And so tonight, uh, after 6, right before sunset, we'll gather up the burnables, if they're not too wet, and we'll, we'll burn them. And that's a tradition that's something we started. Actually, I saw it first in Iowa um, with um, Hal, Hal Geiger. And, uh, and it's something that struck me. And I thought, that's interesting because the brethren in India do that. Their tabernacle is the entire tent, the entire congregation is under. And they put up the boughs of leafy trees and they tie all the fruits, you know, at the beginning of the feast. And by the time the end of the feast is there, the ripeness of the fruits, you know, you get smell and all the kids are eager to get the fruits of the, meaning the fruits of the spirit. And then at sunset, they'll take all the burnables down and they'll burn it. And that, for them, that's picturing going into eternity. So that's what we'll be doing tonight with the prayer service. And so we rejoiced this past week, and it was awesome. And we did that. And um, we've got the rejoicing down pat pretty good. Um, and uh, I, I have to admit, I was really bummed because, well, there's one thing I wanted to do that we couldn't do. And I am thankful for the first time in my marriage that my wife didn't listen to me. As you know, I'm, I'm a little kid, and I wanted fireworks this feast. We were going to set off fireworks. We are going to buy the big, the big stuff, because Amanda has a friend that does the big stuff. You go to the celebrations at the 4th of July. We were going to do some on opening night, because Rian says, you've got to have some opening night. And we're going to do some when we burn uh, the sukkah. We're going to have, you know, to cap off the feast. And Eric said, well, I better need to talk to the owners of the moors. And I said, no, no, no. It's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. That's what I told her. And she thought better of it. And so she talked to Sid and she said, well, I'm glad you asked us first. Because that would have that jeopardized our ability to stay here. And they would have said you would have been fined heavy. So thank you, honey, for not listening to the child. Her fifth child, which is, which is me. And so even without fireworks, though, we certainly made our own bright moments of fellowship and enjoyment this past week, haven't we? We really have. And uh, let it be proclaimed that the people of God know how to party. And is it amazing that, you know, when you read the scriptures, Old and New Testament, you know, Yahweh Elohim says, like a dad, you will party before me. Dad's got the barbecue, everyone, y'all, y'all's going to be there. Because we know when we read the scriptures a little bit later, what happens to the nations that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Dad wants you, everybody at the barbecue. And so we're blessed to understand that. And the question is, uh, and one more thing, you know, as we're rejoicing, we're learning all the different definitions that are added to ish. So I'm looking over at Ben, because I like to rib Ben, because we can do that with one another. And let's... Let's add ish to that list of things that we like to rejoice, can we? Let's do that. Well, I'm going to do it. And what are we rejoicing? What are we rejoicing this week? I mean, it's an open question for the whole congregation because, you know, the answers are going to be different for each one of us. What are we rejoicing? Tommy, where are you at? What are we rejoicing? He can't hear me. I put him on the spot all the time in the Paducah congregation. What are we rejoicing? Jasmine. Jasmine, while you're here, what are we rejoicing this week? God's kingdom. God's kingdom. Tommy, what are we rejoicing this week? There's no wrong answer. That's the beauty of it. What are we rejoicing? All of it. Someone else, what are we rejoicing? Family, what else are we rejoicing? Togetherness, what else are we rejoicing? Fellowship, yeah, there's no wrong answer. Isn't that nice? There's no wrong answers to it. And we're rejoicing all these things. Excellent. You guys are awesome. And I consider all of these same things when I think of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I know my pal Skip Martin, he's really fond of saying that he cannot wait until Jesus comes back to fix this mess that we've made of this world, right? And we do look forward to that day that's coming, do we not? I imagine as the days get darker, and tribulation and terror grip the land, our prayer of come quickly, Lord Jesus, is going to be made with urgent fervor. Our prayers that Jesus would bring the kingdom of God 
to end the evil that engulfs all of us are going to become even more heartfelt and fervent and desired as the death throes of this age rock the planet. We know that our prayer for that time will be urgent, and it's not just going to be words on a page for us because remember what Jesus himself said specifically. And I'm turning to Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 21. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 21. It's up on the screen for those of you in here. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 21. For at that time, there will be great tribulation, unmatched from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be seen again. And if those days are not cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So we're talking about a time so bad that if Jesus does not come back and end where things are going, man and their beastly governments are going to wipe out all life on this rock. And of course, that's what Satan wants us to do, isn't it? That's his whole point. That's his whole purpose. He hates us, and he wants us destroyed. Not just the church, but all of mankind. And yet, mankind is Satan's instrument. Mankind is the instrument that he uses. Jesus himself mentioned this in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 44. John 8, 44. Yeshua said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yahweh Elohim created life. That's his name. In Hebrew, his name is the sound of a breath. Yahweh, life. The devil, Satan, the adversary, created death. And lies led directly to to murder. And this is why he deceived Eve in the garden, knowing that sin would bring death. I mean, he was at the throne of God when he was Hillel or, Lu or Lucifer, remember? He was at the throne of God. He knew that sin had no place before him whom is holy and that sin would mean death for man as much as it meant for he and his demons. And so he goes out and he lies. He deceives Eve, inspires Adam to openly rebel. I know, ladies, there's a line forming for Eve. I, we talked about that. Take a number for better service. And Satan deprived Yahweh Elohim of his desire to have a family of those made in, in his image and his likeness. The angels up there are not in Yahweh Elohim's image or his likeness, even though Yahweh all calls them sons of Yah or sons of God. And this is my own speculation. This is just Michael speaking. Makes me think about whether or not that's what set off his pride that begat his fall at the beginning. Because he was sent down here with a third of the angels. He was on the divine council. He comes down to a, to a physical planet in order for the children that are in the image of Yahweh Elohim to prepare this place for us. Maybe that's what set him off. I don't know, I'm speculating. But he wanted to overthrow the throne of Yahweh Elohim. He says, I will ascend to the sides of the mountain of the north. I will be like the Most High. And he throws a temper tantrum like little kids do. And uh, what was done when he went into the garden was that Satan robbed God of his intention and desire. And given the course he's inspired the age of mankind, all of us are going to end up doing the bidding of the one whom intends to destroy us forever. That seems to be man's direction and obliterate all life on the globe. And that got me to thinking about those things. You know, it's odd to think about those in the millennium, but work with me on this. Got me thinking about these things that occurred at the beginning. 
You know, one might wonder what Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, has to do with Revelation 20. But, you know, I noticed an interesting pattern that repeats itself. And it got me considering what the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, actually is. That the millennial rule of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, is another type of future fulfillment of something that happened anciently. Now, if you're wanting a title for this message, this is my first title, and you guys may be content with it, this is my title. Michael's Myriad Myopic Musings on the Millennium. Can anyone say that five times fast? I couldn't. I could type it, but I couldn't say it. Michael's Myriad Myopic Musings on the Millennium. Where's my wife or my kids? That would be an accurate title about what you're going to hear today. But, well, my wife would go, mm. And so I settled on something more corporate sounding, okay? We're going to go a little bit more corporate sounding. Let's call it, come on now. Let's call it Eden Revisited. Okay, does that sound good? Or if you want to put the subtitle under Michael's Myopic Musings on the Millennium is a subtitle, okay? Eden, the Garden of Eden and the Millennium. The garden at the beginning of mankind and the restoration of that garden upon the earth at the end of the age and Yeshua's reign upon this earth. You might be saying, how am I coming up with this notion? Where am I getting this stuff from? What bizarre stretches of logic am I twisting through to tie the creation account with the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, I'm glad you all asked that question. I appreciate that. Because there is this specific statement made by Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, in three separate places in one book. We're going to turn there together. It's in Revelation chapter 1. The first one is in verse 8. Yeshua says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. The next one, Revelation chapter 2. Oh, sorry, 21, verse 6. I guess that's when there. Revelation 21, 6. Quote, and he told me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. One more. Revelation 22, verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. The beginning and the end. And suddenly the idea of tying Genesis and the creation into the Feast of Tabernacles and the end of the age doesn't sound so bizarre now, does it? In the beginning, we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's go there. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the whole host shouted for joy and rejoiced. And in verse 2, it says, And now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Genesis 1-2. And what's interesting is some of us within the Church of God uh, uh, culture, we like to look at verse 2 as to, be, instead of was without, to became without form and void. Or as, I like this version of it here, the Aramaic Bible in plain English translate verse 2 of Genesis this way. And I like it because English is an imperfect language. It says, the earth was chaos and empty and darkness was on the faces of the depths and the Spirit of God hovered on the face of the waters. I love how the Spirit moves us to get us to a place where similar things are spoken at during the feast. And Jeannie Bauman gave her seminar, and she talked about chaos, and that it all boils down to Yeshua coming back, bringing order out of chaos. And so that stepping stone was set up, and I get to tap it in. So thank you, Jeannie, for doing that for us here today, or through this week. Now, some of you may not ascribe to the gap theory. That's what I call it. That there's a gap between Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and then verse 2. 
which is fine if you don't agree with it. It's not a salvational issue. But I lean towards the idea of the gap in time between verse 1 and 2 because, this is my understanding, Yahweh is not the author of chaos, of confusion, of void, of darkness. You know, he does not create chaos because God don't make no junk, right? Right, honey? God don't make no junk. So if that's the case, who made the darkness and the chaos? The adversary, that's right. The earth was put into existence with everything else in verse 1. And in verse 2, we see water and darkness and chaos cover everything. And then Yahweh, the breath of life, then brings order out of the chaos. And God says seven times in six days that his creation is very good, right? Very good. And he, then he rests. He rests from all his creation, and on the seventh day. Not that Yahweh Elohim needed rest, because in Yah's wisdom, the rest was made for mankind. And Jesus said this himself. In Mark chapter 2, 27, Jesus said, and it was read here earlier, then Jesus declared the Sabbath was made for man, not mankind for the Sabbath. So in this time of rest, Yah gets to enjoy his creation and he tabernacles with the man and the woman after settling them in the garden that he made in Eden, right? See, he walks among his creation. He walks in the garden, he talks with the man and the woman, which makes me think of that song, you know, that we sang earlier the feast. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am in his... I can't sing. That's right. Yeah, you don't want me doing up here singing. Okay? Because... Yahweh Elohim and Adam and Eve have a relationship. They have a relationship with each other, right? And because they have a relationship, Yahweh lays down some ground rules in the garden. Here's the ground rules. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Then the Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim, took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, quote, you may eat freely from every tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And then we know what happens. Satan shows up, comes along, and he robs Yahweh Elohim of his creation. If I could be my brother, he, uh, brother Leon, he robbed him. He robbed Yahweh Elohim of his creation. Death enters the picture for mankind because he deceives him. You know, you see, the, you notice this tree is good for eating. Well, he says, don't touch it because the day we eat of it, we're going to die. And you know the lie he told. So then man is cast out and he has to suffer not only physical death, but all the hard labors of providing for himself and suffering the harvest of his sins. Man is cut off from Yahweh Elohim. Okay, there's a separation, which is death, and that which is life. Chaos then returns to the earth. Heaven and earth are divided. A world of death and sin separating itself from the kingdom of God in the third heaven to bridge that divide, to make a path for man, to come back into Jehovah's presence, God would eventually have to visit that death upon his only begotten son. That was the only way, a perfect sacrifice, who willingly shed blood so that man's iniquity and sin could be covered in a path towards his glorious presence restored. But that sacrifice did not do away with sin, did it? Satan planted sin in the garden, and like a ravenous weed, it spread. And mankind has labored under that harsh taskmaster of a god and pharaoh for 6,000 years of recorded human history. 6,000 years of slavery under the sin and its consequences. And once the seed of sin was sown, it germinated in the mind of man. And though... Every thought in his mind was 
evil continually. That's what scripture says. Chaos and darkness engulfed the world yet again, which resulted in the flood. Yahweh judged mankind as unworthy of life. He repented that he made mankind because every thought was evil continually. And once again, the world was plunged into water and darkness, save who? Only, only who? Noah and his family. And the creation that he boarded into and saved upon the ark. So here we have a repeat, in a way, of the condition that the earth was in at the beginning of Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, when the earth had become formless and empty. This time around, however, Yahweh Elohim, with the help of Noah and his family, remake what Satan and mankind caused to be destroyed. Out of chaos and water and darkness, restoration began. But Jesus tells us there's going to be another repeat of this same thing again happening at the end of the age. I'm going to turn there. We're going to go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 37. Jesus is speaking here. He, when the disciples asked him, what's going to happen at the end of the age? He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's your, that's your time frame. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They were mindless. They didn't care what was going on. Up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they were oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Kind of makes me wonder whether or not Satan thinks three times a charm. You know, this time it's going to work. It's going to work. In Matthew 24, 22, Jesus, speaking about the end of the age in his coming, tells the disciples that the furor of this world is going to engender a global holocaust and is about to inspire mankind to wipe out all of mankind. Matthew 24, verse 21 through 22. For there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Amen. He's going to shorten it. And so... Yahweh steps in. Yeshua comes back on a war horse and cuts that time short. He and his angels and his saints with him. And the remainder of mankind is not happy to see him, are they? Nope. And so what do they do? They go out to make war with him. We read the prophecy in Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. Joel 3 verse 2. It says, it's a prophecy, yes, in those days and at that time, when I restore Judah and Jerusalem from captivity, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there I will enter into judgment against them concerning my people, my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations as they divided up my land. Now that indictment is not only for the physical nations of men, but also, in my understanding, the Elohim under Satan, whom stole the land from Yahweh Elohim to begin with in the garden. And God puts an end to the control of the land by Satan and his demons, and the men he rules as we read in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9, which tells us, Zechariah 14, 9, On that day the Lord will become king over all the earth. The Lord alone 
and his name alone. There is no other. It's just him. Amen. Over all the earth. So there's the time frame, right? Let's jump down to Zechariah uh, 14. Let's jump down to uh, 9, and then we'll read 12. What is this? Verse 12. Okay. It says, and this will be the plague with which the Lord strikes all the peoples who have warred against Jerusalem. This is the 200 million man army that comes in to attack Jesus. It says their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths while they stand on their feet, right? He enters into judgment with them in the valley of Hinnom. That's what we read. Or you might say Armageddon, same name. They're done. All 200 million of them. They get this treatment here that you saw at the end of the movie, The Raiders of, of the Lost Ark, on a massive scale, right? Yeah, this happens to them. They gone. They done. He's, he's not, God ain't messing around no more, right? And then the millennium begins. The Feast of Tabernacles upon this earth is initiated. Amen? But first, okay, what has to happen? Let's uh, jump to Revelation chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1. Okay. Come on. 21. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the keys to the abyss. Make sure I got that right. Holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a brief period of time. Go to the next verse here. Continuing on. Then I saw th the thrones and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Isn't that what we're picturing this week? Isn't that a beautiful picture? And then it says, and then the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead, or all the dead, or all y'all's dead, did not come back to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. And they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Amen? Hallelujah. That's right. And this, we understand, is the millennium, the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, the thousand-year reign of Christ with the saints upon the earth. And that's what this time pictures according to our understanding and tradition. But is this it? Is there more? Is this, is the Feast of Tabernacles the big fulfillment everything has been building up to? I'm just asking the question out there. Again, these are my, Michael's musings. Is we, the build up to the Feast and the Feast of Tabernacles, that's the big thing, right? You know, the return of Christ and the binding of Satan for a thousand years. And I thought to myself, I go, well, is the harvest finished yet? No, it's not finished yet. Has all of it been gathered and brought into the storehouse? The city of God that comes, to, has it been brought up yet? No, not yet. Brethren, that, the beginning of the millennium is just the beginning. The beginning of the beginning. Let's skip what I'd like, like to say. The beginning of the beginning. The thousand years is just the start. In fact, you know, I, I'm not sure it's going to look like this happy interpretation much at all. I think that at the beginning of the millennium, when Yeshua Messiah comes back and his feet hit the Mount of Olives and they split, 
You know, you know that verse. I think the earth isn't going to look like we're picturing it, the lion laying down with the lamb, the little child. That's not there. When he comes back, the earth is going to look like that. Right? The world will have gone through the ravages of both the great tribulation, which is Satan's wrath on the church of God, the people of God, and then the remnant of God. And then you have the wrath of God upon the unrepentant mankind that follows, and that's what's going to be left. And it's kind of scary to add up all the numbers of people that are going to be a third of a third, and a third that's left, and a third of that. Burned up, gone, destroyed. People, seas, land, trees burned up. That's what the earth is going to look like. It's going to be kind of a nasty time, and that's what Christ is coming back to. Kind of sobering. Okay? And, let me get my note. So just it's similar, okay? It's similarly, as it were. Just as at the time of Genesis 1, verse 2, when the earth was chaos and empty, and just as it was when the ark with Noah finally found dry land, the earth at the time of Christ's return is in a state of chaos and ruin. Order must be brought out of it. There's no great fall harvest yet at the return of our master. There's the first fruits that go up, they receive their reward. Uh, in my understanding, it's like there's a divine council up there, you know, in their seats. And right now, angels are in placeholders up there. But those are reserved for those that are coming up in the first resurrection. It's kind of my, kind of lean that way. It kind of makes sense to me. Um, that's why, you know, there, there are offices. Jesus said, I'm going, and there are offices. There are mansions for you. We're preparing for you up there. You have a place up there. And, uh, and that, I think that's kind of what I understand, and thank you for allowing me to share it with you. So those of the remnant who survive and come out of the tribulation are settled into the land that God has promised them from the beginning, okay, for the work that they're going to do to assist Yeshua the Christ to restore all things. Let's read Luke chapter uh, 3, verse 4. Uh, Luke 3, verse 4, and this is actually from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. It says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked ways shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all humanity will see Jehovah's salvation, or God's salvation. Now, this verse is almost always attributed to the fulfillment via John the Baptist. I think it's just a little bit more than that. And it has a millennial application. Because all humanity did not see God's salvation 2,000 years ago. But they will. They will at the end of this time frame that we're currently celebrating. And if the mountains are going to be made low and the valleys raised up and the deserts bloom... This kind of gets me back to my, my buddy Skip Martin's off-repeated statement that he cannot wait till Jesus comes back to fix this mess. Well, is Yeshua going to do it all? Is he going to do it all? Is he going to snap his fingers and do it all supernaturally? We know he could, but is that, is that what he's going to do? Is Jesus going to fill in the valleys, make every mountain and hill low? Or will the people, his nation, do these works in tandem with the saints. I mean, consider what happens after those 200 million soldiers we read above from Zechariah are raided to the lost ark and rotted while they stand on their feet. Because here's what happens to them. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 12 and 13. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them, and it will bring them renown on the day I display my glory, declares the Lord Yahweh Elohim. Now, Yeshua could have just atomized every single molecule of these enemies that come against him, but he doesn't. He has the remnants of his people the ones whom Satan and the nations went to war upon and waged tribulation against them, he spends, they spend seven months, that's what it says, burying them. And you know, this is consistent to how Yahweh performs 
with his covenant with his people. You know, for example, he did not just hand the promised land over to Israel. He could have, like a parent, buy your kid that, you know, that Lamborghini because he's 16, right? Is he going to appreciate it? No, he certainly isn't. Okay, that doesn't happen. Israel had to work to achieve what God was going to give them. They had to fight for it. They had to overthrow the Canaanites and expel their gods from the land. They had to raise their cities, build their own cities so that they would appreciate it. They had skin in the game. As Ben pointed out in his seminar, God does 99.99% of the work. We have to do the 1%. Israel had to do the 1%. God gave them the victory, but they had to actually do some work. So they, they had to have skin in the game. Immediately at Christ returns, the conditions on this earth, again, they look like this, will be like they were at the beginning. Or they'll be at the world at the time just after the flood. The earth's going to be in darkness and chaos. And once again, God steps in to recreate what he intended from the beginning. Each time he does so, the mechanisms or the tools that he uses to recreate are different. Okay, the first time Yahweh worked alone to make his creation, right? The second time he worked with Noah and his family to remake and repopulate the earth. And at the return of the King of Kings, Yeshua will be accompanied by the resurrected saints and the remnant of his people scattered around the world that are still alive that he brings back to the land, to Israel, where they will work with Messiah and the saints to remake Eden. But I think it's going to be remade on a global scale. It's not going to be a small patch of land. It's going to start there, but like it's going to be the reverse of a weed. Life is going to go out. And that is what I think the millennium is. The reign of Christ and the remaking of Eden for the purpose of putting mankind back into it. Because there's going to be things there during the millennium that were once in the original Garden of Eden. They're going to lead directly for mankind to find eternal life. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 22. We'll read verse 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the main street of the city. Talking about Jerusalem here. On either side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit and yielding a fresh crop for each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is also a scripture that was brought up, um, I think, by Jeannie uh, earlier in her seminar. So at the beginning of Genesis, there was the tree of life in the garden, right? And there was the other tree that was in there, the knowledge of good and evil. But here at, at, in the book of Revelation, at the end, what do we have? We have both the water of life and two trees of life, one on either side of that river of the water of life. So I'm of the understanding that during the time of Christ's reign, during the millennium, during the Feast of Tabernacles, the thousand-year Sabbath rest for man, as some understand it, the major work of restoring all things as Yahweh intended from the beginning is going to be going on. It's a giant work program, folks. You know, I used to go up to Illinois and drive, and they have two seasons, winter and road construction. Right? Well, in the kingdom of God, when it comes, it's going to be a thousand years work program to restore what Yahweh intended from the beginning. And that's going to take a thousand years to accomplish it. Okay? Makes me thought, are they unionized? I'm not sure. Anyway. All right, but let's, the Father is working and Yeshua is working. And the saints will be working along with the people living on the earth at that time. Eden is going to need landscape architects, earth movers, builders, sculptors, planters, cultivators, and tenders, right? Turn to Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2. 
It says the wilderness and the land will be glad, as glad as we are here this week. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It will bloom profusely and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of Yahweh Elohim, the splendor of our God. Mankind is going to see the Shekinah glory of the Lord, the splendor of Yahweh. And in that splendor, are the deserts going to just blossom miraculously? Or will mankind have a hand in the work that is about to happen then? You know, man plants and waters. Who brings the increase? Amen. That's right. Exactly. And this has been a source of debate among those who've seen the millennium as a 1,000-year Sabbath rest of complete rest, a millennium of total rest. And they would probably say that my musings here are way off base because Yeshua would never break the Sabbath by working because, well, they say they're adamant, work will not be done during a Sabbath rest, millennium or not. I get that. Of course, I'm a rebel and I don't really see it that way. Because first, remember what we read in Mark 2.27. Shabbat was made for man, not man for Shabbat. And I seem to recall an incident where men decided to tell Yeshua what was lawful on Shabbat and what was not. That's found in John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. It says, now because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews began to persecute him. But Jesus answered them, to this very day, my father is at work and I too and working. What work was Jesus doing in this account? Anyone remember? That's right. He, he restored a man's leg back to health. Looking at you, Kristen. Looking at you. He came over and told them, do you want to be healed? He asked them that first. You know, do you want to be healed? Because sometimes we like to stay in our comfort zone, even if it's a debilitation. Right, exactly. But he told them he had that 1% to do, like Ben said. Yahweh Elohim was going to do 99.9%, .9%, but he had 1%. He told them, get up, stand up, pick up your bed, and walk. That was the 1%. And he did it. And the Pharisees, who were laws of laws, Shabbat, Shabbat, they were outraged. Whoa, you can't do that on Shabbat. Who gave you authority to break Shabbat by healing? And yet Yeshua did it. And therefore, my question is, would the restoration of this world from death to life, from chaos and darkness to light, be any different? I don't think so. But I'm a rebel, so you never know. You might have to talk to me about it afterwards. Isaiah 51, verse 3. Isaiah 51, 3. For the Lord will comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and melodious song. And we were doing that all week. Thanksgiving, melodious song. We worship. It's great. And making the wilderness like Eden and the deserts like the garden of the Lord probably might be a work that men are going to do at the direction and assistance of the saints in Yeshua. For example, you know, today in Israel, those that have been there in arid places, Jews are able to grow crops. They're able to make the wilderness bloom and deserts look like a garden. You know, what I find interesting is that when the Jews were removed from those places and the land handed back over to the Palestinians, the Canaanites could not keep those gardens and blossoms alive. Those places died and returned to wilderness and desert. But mankind has learned the ability to turn such places, following God's laws and his direction, into gardens. And given the opportunity and the peace to do so, that can be accomplished. Isaiah 58, verse 12. This is another prophecy. It says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will rest restore the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of the breach, 
restorer of the streets of dwelling. Keep in mind that picture of the apocalypse of all the cities in ruin. I think this kind of applies there. Now, this might be a good place to muse a little bit on the parable of the talents and the rewards of cities that are going to be given to those who have made a return on the investment that Yeshua gave them. We might be able to just see a little bit how that might apply during this time for the saints in the first resurrection. It's one of, of my many myriad musings that I'm throwing out there. There's a divine council, people that are in charge of things. How many cities are you going to be in charge of? What would you do with the talent Yahweh Elohim gave you? What kind of return on investment have you provided what he has given you? Again, remember, salvation is open to all. There's one salvation issue, but rewards? You know, there's no salvation by works, but rewards is a whole other animal. You know, you read that in all the parables that we read that uh, Yeshua gives. Of course, there's going to be miraculous instances and things that only Yahweh can perform and do. And then there's going to be things that man in the flesh can do. Mankind is going to have skin in the game of the restoration of Eden. We'll read this in Isaiah 35. Okay, 5 through 8. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. The waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched grounds will become a pool. The thirsty land springs of water. In the haunt where jackals once lay, there will be grass and reeds and papyrus. And there will be a highway called the way of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it. And only those who walk in the way and fools will not stray onto it. Next verse. No lion will be there, and no vicious beast will go up upon it. Such will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk upon it. So the redeemed of the Lord will return and enter Zion with singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. There will be safety and security and justice which offers each person the liberty to seek and find without fear, without any ridicule, and any obstacle to that water of life. The only obstacle that's going to exist at that time is going to be the self. Opportunity is made when there's justice, when there's safety and security. Because, brethren, that's what liberty is. Our freedom to follow Yeshua as he leads us, to choose our own you know, path to follow him, or we could follow the path to destruction. It's our choice. The major difference between the creation and the restoration after the flood and the restoration after the return of Christ is that unlike the creation or the flood, at the time of the millennium, Satan is bound with his demons in the abyss, locked away from being able to influence mankind. Man will be given a rest. Boy, do we need that rest. I need that rest. From the harsh labor of that Pharaoh, that taskmaster, Satan can suck it. Right, Kristen? And we will be given a complete Sabbath rest from the influence and temptation of the adversary, Satan the devil. Now, that does not mean, at least in my understanding, that sin is not going to be present in the millennial reign of Christ. I've heard people say there'll be no sin anymore because Satan's locked up. Well, is Satan the author of every single sin that's out there? Not all sin, I think, comes from Satan. What's the natural mind of man? Hostile to the law of God. It's an enmity or odds with God. It's not subject to the laws of God and cannot be on its own. Yes, Sin is going to exist in the thousand-year reign of Jesus' reign. Some people might, wait, well, no, there's no sin when Jesus is back here. And I'm like, well, let me share you some thoughts of what I, what I have here, because I think that there is a little bit. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14, beginning in verse 17. This is a prophecy. Hasn't happened yet. Zechariah 14, beginning in verse 17. And, the, and should any of the families of the earth 
Okay, this is all the nations. Not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Then the rain will not fall on them. No blessings are coming. And if the people of Egypt will not go up and enter in, then the rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Our church culture didn't write that. I didn't write that. Those are the words of Yahweh Elohim. That's what he says. This time hasn't happened yet. There's going to be punishment if they don't go up to keep it. Defiance of the law of God, of his word, of Yeshua, the King of kings and Lord of lords, I think that would qualify as sin, don't you? I kind of look at it that way. And here we have entire nations such as Egypt who refuse to obey him. And so they're going to be punished by having the provisions and blessings withheld from them. But then prophecy tells us that mankind at that time we're going to have some, they're going to have some direct help. Isaiah 30, verse 20 and 21. Okay. Isaiah 30, verse 20 and 21. The Lord will give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, but your teacher will no longer hide himself. And with your own eyes, you will see him. And whether you turn to the right or turn to the left, your ears will hear this command behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. That brethren right there is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Preaching the gospel, teaching mankind everything I've commanded you. What are we doing? This is the way. Walk in it. This is the way that leads to life. The way you guys are going, you guys are marching to death. This is the way to life. That's our commission. Some have taught that those teachers and voices will be those whom are kings and priests to Yeshua, whom are his saints ruling with him at the time. Amen. That's, we're going to, might as well get the training now, folks. Okay, classroom time's over. Get out of the classroom, folks. Get into the internship. Some of us have been in the church of God for decades. It's time to stop sitting and warming a seat and filling your head with knowledge. Let's use the knowledge. Let's get into the internship. It's time. We need to do that. Okay, and so while Satan and his demons are locked away in the abyss, man demonstrates that they will still sin. And that said, mankind at that time of restoration, they're going to have it a whole lot easier than you and I do today. If you get anything out of this message today, folks, this is what I want you to get out of it. Brethren, today, you were called to overcome yourself, this world, and Satan the devil, okay? That's a tall order. That's a tall order. During the millennial reign of Yeshua the Christ, men, men who are living at that time, they're only going to have to overcome the self because Satan and his demons are bound. They only have to come, overcome themselves. And man has his own natural proclivity to sin, but at that time that, that happens, the tree of life, two of them, are going to be standing there. And the river of the water of life is going to be freely flowing out of there with no obstacles for anyone to go up to drink from it, except the self. The self could prevent them from going. Nope, not for me. Don't want to do that. It could happen. Brethren, this truth should encourage you like nothing else. You were called now at this age now, to overcome the incredible burden of self, this world, and it's ugly out there and getting uglier, and the adversary. This whole entire system of Satan and his demons, Yahweh Elohim looked at your heart. He looked at you. And he realized that with his help and his spirit in you, with Yeshua literally living in you, you would overcome your yourself this world and Satan. You would not be weak or hard in heart to reject that calling because, brother, your time is now. That should be encouraging. He looked at you and said, you know what? When I give you help, when Yeshua lives in you, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. 
And those that aren't with us, they're not going to make it right at this in this age. They're going to wait. They're going to come up at the end of the uh, the end of the harvest. Just quick, it's not my notes. I'm going off notes, Erica. I know, scary, right? My sister has an unconverted spouse. She's in a very difficult situation. She cries. Yahweh Elohim has saved his life miraculously twice. And you'd think that would have woken him up to the fact that God wanted his attention. But nope. He's about this world, money, and everything else. And my sister's despondent. She doesn't understand. And she doesn't understand. I've been praying. I've been fasting for him. I don't get it. I said, until she came to the feast. And she learned about what we understand to be the second resurrection on the eighth day. I said, I just said, you know, she said, something's making sense here. I said, well, your husband's time may not be now. Ben talked about God's timing, right? God's timing. Those that may not be with us or we're not called now, it's not time for them. It's not time for them. Their time is going to come up when everything's ready for them. Your time is now. That should be encouraging. He looked at you and said, you guys are going to make it. I know, I'm looking at Gary, I'm looking at, I'm looking at all y'all out there, you're going to make it. So I'm going to call you now. Yeah, it's going to be rough, it's going to be hard. With my help, you're going to make it. Just don't lose your faith in me. No matter what you go through, I always joke about this. Yahweh Elohim does not care if you look like a Swiss cheese. He wants you in his family for eternity. His infirmities that you're beset with, now this flesh is weak. But the spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. Don't let the flesh impair your spirit. I don't quit, right? Don't quit. No matter what you're, you're beset with, no, no matter what the adversary throws at you, brethren, don't quit because dark times are coming. All you got to do is just scan the news this morning. It's coming. But don't lose your spirit. Hold on to it. Hold on to your faith. You're going to be able to make it with his help. So the Feast of Tabernacles, the time of Christ tabernacling with man on this temporary rock, is tied to the creation, the replenishment and restoration of all things as intended from the beginning. Eden will be planted for a time of tabernacles, for that great fall harvest yet to come. The Alpha and the Omega, which is and will be forever our Messiah and Savior. Amen. Right? But then, Scripture tells us, that what happened anciently will happen again in like manner. Because at the end of those thousand years to come, in the restored garden that is spread out from Jerusalem into the whole world, what's going to happen? Satan's going to be let loose, and he's going to once again go into the garden. And those who've had no experience with it are going to be tested, right? Right? And he's going to go out to deceive mankind in order to bring about more death because that's what he does. So he goes into the garden to deceive the nations that were born and raised during the most incredible time of peace in all human history. And once again, attempting to dep deprive Yahweh of a millennium of work. Satan is going to be the instrument used to test those living on the earth in that garden who saw the King of Kings and Lord of Lords whom were taught and told the truth by his saints their entire life, but whom were never tested and never given a choice. We have a choice to make. God's not going to make it for us. To choose life or to choose what Satan offers them, which will lead to their death. Let's turn to Revelation 20, beginning in verse 7. Revelation 20, beginning in verse 7. It says, When the thousand years are complete... Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to assemble them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the seashore. And they marched across the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, into which the beast and false prophet had already been thrown. And there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so this thousand years that we're picturing and imagining this week, this time of refreshing and rejoicing, we're celebrating pictures of the time that we're together with our high priest and his father, whom are ruling us, 
Eden revisited. It will be remade not only for those who will live now and grow up during the millennial reign of Christ, but I'm using, it will be, it's being prepared. It's a buildup for the giant great harvest to come up at the very end. Because it kind of makes no logical sense to me that a thousand years are going to be spent preparing the earth for the gargantuan, massive, unbelievable harvest to come up. You know, and it's just going to be burned up at that point. The Ezekiel 37 Valley of Dry Bones, it comes up every Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to bring it up. Ezekiel 37 Valley of Dry Bones, the great resurrection of the dead that we read in Revelation 20 and verse 12. And there's an estimation that there could be 70 billion human beings. The way we have now, like eight, nine billion? Eight. Imagine, now I don't know how these guys got the number. They were doing, I'm not a math guy. My wife is. But I remember these guys wrote, they estimated maybe 70 billion people possibly at this time. There's some Christians that know, know some Christian fellows that know their math. Math ain't my skill. So these people are going to come up into what I muse is that Garden of Eden recreated in the millennium that's taken a thousand years. Because it says they're going to be resurrected into flesh, not spirit. Okay? Ezekiel 37, verse 5 and 6. Ezekiel 37, 5 and 6. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath, the breath of life, to enter you. And you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh grow upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath within you so that you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Yahweh Elohim. Okay? Imagine this. 70 billions resurrected to flesh. 70 billions resurrected to flesh and placed in what I think is that garden to stand before the throne of Yahweh Elohim, perhaps the great white throne, and be judged as the books are opened. And those who never even heard of the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, are going to be introduced to him. The water of life is there, flowing along with the two trees of life. I find that fascinating. Now, these musings of mine can easily be, you can argue them. It's good. They're musings. That's why I titled it the way I did. How each detail unfolds, it's foggy to me. Because the book may have some details that are yet sealed to us. It may not have been unsealed to us yet. I don't know. What I know for certain is that what we read here is going to happen. That's what I know. It's going to happen. Because when Yahweh speaks, it's going to happen. I have faith. I believe it. Now, the exact chronology, exactly how, when, and where. You know, to me, it's not as important as the faith in belief in what scripture tells us is going to happen. This will happen, okay? The dead are going to come up to physical life. There's going to be a river of the water of life and two trees of life on either side of that river. And we are blessed with the understanding that Christ judges the heart in absolute perfection. He is our advocate and our redeemer. And 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that he is not willing for any to perish, but for all, or if you're in Western Kentucky, all y'all, all y'all to come to repentance. So if you're taking any, anything useful from this myopic meandering of musings I offer today, God consistently uses human instrumentality to bring forth his plan. Because then... Well, the reason we are where he uses human instrumentality is because we're part of that plan. Why not, right? We have a work to do now, and we're also going to have a work to do then. And in so doing that work, we put skin in the game, an investment in the work that Yahweh is doing and bringing about. Now, most importantly, Yahweh is going to be true to his word. His word is true. We have to believe what Yeshua tells us. Let's go to Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 18. I'll take a sip of lemonade here. Oh, you're so right, Mel. Lemons are great. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 18. 
It says, do not call to mind the former things. Pay no attention to the things of old. Behold, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people I formed for myself will declare my praise. He will do as he intended from the beginning. He will use whom he, who he will to bring it about, even Satan. He'll even use Satan to bring it about. Remember Job? Remember Job? We talked about Job. God used Satan himself to work righteousness in his servant Job so he could bless him sevenfold over what he had been before Yah permitted that trial that Satan instigated by his accusations. And what a tribulation that was. Imagine seven of your children dying in your fields, in your land, your home, everything destroyed. And then you're beset with boils. And then your friends and your own wife goes, just curse him and die. What a tribulation. Could you endure such a tribulation as Job did without turning on God or losing your faith? It's a fair question to ask. Yahweh chastises and corrects every son and daughter he loves for our own benefit or those we are instruments to benefit. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 8. Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Let's add daughters in there too. My son, do not take lightly the discipline of the Lord. And do not lose heart. Don't quit. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastises every son he receives. Enduring suffering as discipline, God is treating you as sons. For what's, what son is not disciplined by his father? If you do not experience discipline like everyone else, then you are illegitimate children and not true, true sons. Let's keep going on here. Furthermore, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Should we not much more submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a short time as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our own good so that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it yields a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who've been trained by it. No one likes us, none of us like a spanking. I certainly didn't. My wife tells me that her granny would send her out back, go get me a switch. If you brought a little one, Granny would go out and get one. You didn't want Granny to go out and get one. Could it be that Yahweh Elohim would use Satan to work his righteousness in order to foster a repentant mankind? Not just in Job, but Yahweh's using Satan to bring about salvation to all men. That's wild, isn't it? One of Michael's musings, because Yahweh Elohim is sovereign. He takes responsibility for everything, even the evil that's done in the land, correct? And that's an amazing thing. And I muse these questions because, well, we have biblical precedent. If you think about it, it's almost comical that the, super, that the supernatural being is, who's having a hissy fit is being used in order to prepare and save the very human race that he wants to destroy. Talk about the perfect revenge. Satan wants us dead, and God's like, well, I'm going to use you in order to make them alive forever and ever. How about that? Because I'm dead, and I call the shots, right? Romans 8, 31. Or no, it's start with Romans 8, 28. My favorite scripture, brethren, I've told you before, keep this in mind. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Everyone here that can hear my voice, y'all, all y'all was called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 31. Because you love Yahweh Elohim. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Not even Satan, the devil. Not his demons. You got nothing to be afraid of unless you give them space. Don't. 
Satan can suck it. Right, Kristen? He can suck it. God is for us. God is for you. Yeshua, our Savior, is for you. No, nothing can be against us. I think Satan's going to be used to bring mankind to holiness. And that cracks me up. And uh, that's what my musings have led me to understand. All things work together. Believe that. Hold on to that. Have faith in that. Trust in that word. Because whatever we're going to suffer now, he's going to work out for good in the end. And the omega is what all of us are looking forward to. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 21. Getting to the end, folks. Getting to the end. I only have a few more paragraphs here. It says, repent then. Acts 3, 19 to 21. Repent then and turn back so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of Yahweh Elohim, and that he may send Yeshua, the Christ, who has been appointed for you. Heaven must keep him until the time comes for the restoration of all things, which God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Times of refreshing. And the restoration of all things tells us that once what once existed and was lost is going to be restored. It's going to be revisited. When the rewards are handed out at the coming of our Messiah, you're going to have an office, a stewardship to assist in that restoration of all things, to restore the Garden of Eden for the family of mankind. Think about that. Wow. Let's do Keith. Wow. That's awesome. And why not? By that time, the experiences we've learned by actually doing Matthew 28, 19, and 20, to turn those we know towards God and repentance should be good proof and evidence that we can be trusted with even greater responsibility in that kingdom. Yeshua is going to establish it and reign over it in those days to come. And after that, well, after that, that's where Roger's going to take us tomorrow. And for the close of the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, behold, the Alpha and Omega is coming quickly. Even so, come Lord Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Mike. If you do it about 15 minutes longer, I was kind of getting full back there eating some of the snacks. So. <laughs> yeah, so band and choir come up. This is Mike's, uh, his uh, speaker's choice. Uh, you are holy, a prince of peace. And I have a quick announcement that was given to me that on Sunday, for those that are observing the last great day for them, the Salmon and Hawker family invite you to cabin 32 at noon, 12 o'clock, for Bible study and bring your leftovers in the fridge, including beer and steak. <laughs> oh, no. no. Okay. See, that, that's, that's, that was just my own interpretation, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> To eat on and to make it easier to travel. So, yes, if you could just kind of, that's what the smorgasbord is for today. Just come in and, and today, today's the fat day. Come in and eat it up so we don't have to tote this stuff back in home in the cars. Uh, so, Kristen's service dog and Scott's will be there. So, let them know if you have allergies to dogs that we can put them in the back room. Cabin 32 is behind the office in the restaurant with a long wooden wrap up the front deck. See you all next year. All right. Everybody stand. Two more hymns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, well, any way you want to. This one's supposed to be where the guys sing the one part and the ladies sing the other part. 
You don't have to do it that way, but you can certainly. Well, do it that way. Let me work, I just don't want to dictate everybody to do it that way. Yes, okay. You'll figure it out. The girls have the harder part, just to let you know. Look, I remember hearing Rianne and, and Chloe do this women's part by heart. And that is amazing. To, I mean, this is a tough song, so I, I, I'm glad I'm uh, of the male persuasion when it comes to It's song. especially hard the way we usually play it really fast, but I'm going to try to take it easy. Storm. 
the one who walks upon the sea Earth and heaven are your own Yet you're watching over me How majestic is your name Cause there's none like you There is none like you Together we proclaim the power of your name Cause there is none like Before your throne, your kingdom will forever reign. We will sing a song of praise to the ancient of days, because there is none like you. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of we proclaim the power of your name is there is none like you how majestic is your name how majestic is your name how majestic is your name Carmen for closing prayer. I'd like to share a little something that song was just uh, reminding me of something that happened this morning. Um, we were sitting here having the seminar and I look up and I see my dog walking by and it's like, oh, shucks, I forgot to take care of him. <laughs> so I ran back up there, tied him up and everything. I thought I put him on the, on the uh, what do you call it, the deck. And I get back down here, and he's back down here again. He just wants to be down here. And I think, I, I know that he knows there's just such love here. And it's just like, and so I was, you guys probably don't know this, most of you don't, but his name is Noni. And it was because I told him, when we moved to South Carolina, we told him that we'll, if we get a spot, we'll get you a dog. And so everywhere we went for like months, he would say, Mom, look at that dog. Mom, look at that dog. So finally I told him, I said, Hon, I think the best dog for us is Nun, N-O-N-E. And so, you know, today as we're, you know, celebrating this last day, I just love Yah's sense of humor. And I had this thought that, 
Yah was showing me that through my dog, he wants to be here. And this day is a day representing to us the seventh day and that tomorrow, of course, it's for all, everybody. And he wants none to miss him. And so here, my dog's name got a new name today or meaning for me today, of which I said none. It's just like God wants none to be lost. And that just really touched my heart. My dog kind of taught me a lesson today. And that song was just really tied in there. So Abba Father, we just, I thank you for the faith that you've given us. It's been so awesome this week just to be taught about expanding our faith and, and just, just sharing in that with all the teachings. I picture, you know, when you think about all the memories from the last days, and, and they're not done yet. We still have tonight, we still have tomorrow. And it's just, but yeah, those, li those pictures, like that little gal up here that was standing on her tippy toes to get to the microphone, to just all the teachings, and, and we've just been soaking in that word, Lord, and, and just thank you, God, for the faith that you have given us. And help us this year as we get ready to head out that you will just keep expanding and maturing our faith and that there will be in our hearts just nothing wavering, God, that we will just, just toe the straight line and we won't look to the right or to the left. And thank you, God, that these days, these people, every single one here, God, that it's like John said, that we've passed a little bit of your spirit to each one of us as we've hugged or smiled. And just thank you, Yah, for that. We just praise your mighty name. And we look forward to the next year already, but we do want to just say thank you for the rest of this day and tomorrow. And we just praise your name for all the love that's been here. It is going to be hard to go. But help us to just stay strong and just thank you, God. There's a phrase in, in Hebrew, and it's toda abba. And it's become one of my favorite words, a couple words to say together. Just toda abba for the way you're working in us and preparing us. We love you, Yah. Amen. 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 Amen.